Good evening. We're going to call the meeting of the Personnel Administrative Affairs Committee to order. Today is Monday, Janu January. Monday, June 5th, 2023, and the time is 7 p.m. We are in the Aldermanic Chamber. Could the clerk please call the roll? Uh, Alderman, Alderwoman at large, Shoshana Kelly, Chairwoman. I'm here. Alderman at large, Ben Clemens, Vice Chair. Here. Alderman Tyler Govia. Here. Alderman Thomas Lopez. Here. Alderman Derek Tebow is here. Also in attendance is Alderman Jetty um, and the mayor and uh, Mayor Donchus and Bobby Bagley, uh, the director of uh, health and human services for the city. Okay. Um, we are going to move on to public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Please state your name and address for the record. <coughs> Gloria Ortolano, 41 Berkeley Street. I know that on the agenda tonight is a discussion about public comment, and I want to thank the ACLU and the New England First Amendment Coalition for getting involved in encouraging the city to change their comment, and I want to thank the board members that sponsored it and those that signed on a couple weeks ago to participate in making that change. I'd like to make you aware that the Board of Assessors changed their language in 2020, three years ago, long before Lori Ortolano was the problem. And their clause actually says, um, uh, remarks, uncivil remarks will not be tolerated. They address it just that way. It's not a matter of vulgar or inappropriate, it's uncivil remarks. And I objected to that from the beginning. It was Attorney Leonard who wrote that public comment policy, pitched it to the board and got them to agree to it. Um, you know, I watched people come in there on abatement issues. Those can be heated issues and make a comment. One lady, you know, what the hell's going on? Shut down, inappropriate. Um, a very senior citizen with a walker who was a military guy um, used a swear word when they wouldn't give him his exemption and they thanked him for his service. He said, I don't give a blank about my service. I want my exemption. Boom, slapped on the wrist. I mean, I think that's ridiculous, and that policy over at the Board of Assessors should be changed. I never agreed with what you did here. I thought it was very reactive for the mayor to come out swinging from the finance committee meeting when he was upset because I was addressing deficiencies I saw in um, Director Cummings. It just, and he brought up the whole issue of the word used from a year earlier. There was no need to do that, except he was inflamed. And the board jumped on that, reacted, wrote a policy that I think it was wrong a year ago. So, you know, I, I, I don't know if you also the vi saw the video of the gentleman um, who came into City Hall a week ago Friday and made a video um, for about 15 minutes about uh, free press in City Hall, being able to film audio and video film City Hall and the objections he was met with that. I too bought a body cam because of all the arrest attempts on me when I came into City Hall. And I wrote to Police Chief Rourke and got an email response back today, as well as the um, Chief Prosecutor for the um, Police Department. And both of them said, Chief Rourke said, there's no issue at all. We were called to City Hall. We were contacted by somebody in City Hall. We showed up that day, but there was no action taken because a citizen can audio video record in a public place. And I will tell you, the city gave me a really hard time about that. And it was never right from a year ago. 30 seconds. I didn't like having a body cam, but I felt I needed it for my pr protection. So I hope that you all vote to change that public comment policy and strike that language and just, uh, you know, let citizens have the rights that they're entitled to. Thank you. Would anyone else like to give public comment? Seeing none, communications? There is none. Interviews. Um, we have the Mine Falls Park Advisory Committee, uh, Matthew Roscoe, new appointment, term to expire May 9th, 2026, 17 Nova Road, Nashua, New Hampshire, 03064. Mr. Mayor, would you like to speak to your appointment? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am introducing uh, Matt Roscoe, who <clears throat> I have nom nominated to be a member of the Mine Falls Park Advisory Committee. Uh, Matt grew up in Nashua. He came to one of the ward meetings and expressed an interest in serving uh, the city. 
and at the time we talked about his interests, and he uh, is very interested in the outdoors, in conservation, in environmental issues, in nature. Uh, he had been a Boy Scout and achieved the rank of Eagle Scout uh, a few years back. Um, and he was a member of the Green Club at Nashua High North, uh, which was in charge of the recycling program. So uh, it seemed that the Mine Falls Advisory Committee is a good fit for Mr. Roscoe. Uh, he has attended uh, one meeting of the advisory committee and uh, has would be there tonight, but there's a conflict with us tonight here, so could not make that one. But he has also participated in a couple of the cleanup days that the advisory committee holds, uh, the trail days that they hold in Mine Falls. And as you probably know, the Mine Falls Park Advisory Committee often does more than just advise the park rec about, the, the public works about the park, but also con conducts activities such as cleanups and uh, other very positive uh, uh, work in, the, in Mine Falls Park. Therefore, again, uh, uh, Mr. Roscoe is a good fit and will, I believe, be a very uh, positive force on the advisory committee. And with that, I give you Matt Roscoe. I'll ask him to say a few, a little bit about himself and of his interest in serving on the, uh, the advisory committee. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. All right, so yeah, I'm Matt Roscoe. Um, I was born and raised here right in Nashua. And I've always been a proud citizen of the city. And so I felt that I wanted to be able to give more to the city. So yeah, I, I reached out to the mayor and tried to work out a way for me to get more involved. And as he said, it was a perfect opportunity hearing about this committee with my previous background and um, environmental issues and stuff like that. So I felt that this was my calling and I would like to see the kind of impact and improvement I can make to the city uh, through this position. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Alderman to to Alderman Lopez. Um, so Mine Falls, I noticed uh, in your um, email uh, dis letter, I guess, uh, you had described that you are a soccer player or have been, um, you have an interest in uh, nature and the environment. Mine Falls has everything from soccer fields to road races to uh, BMX biking, a cell phone complex. Um, how do you think the city can, do, can protect uh, Mine Falls while, uh, while managing the diverse needs of the community uh, that uses it? Yeah, so I think it's very important to be able to protect the park. And that's why I want to be able to promote more of the trail days. We do get an amazing turnout of people that go there. But I'd love to kind of promote that more so people uh, can go there and volunteer to be able to clean up the park more and kind of make it more aware of the needs of the park as well as um, the issues that we have in there, such as the trash, a lot of um, different stuff like that. Uh, personally, about two months ago, I went through the park and did a lot of the trash cleanup. So I like to make that more of an aware issue. And I understand most people know that that's an issue with uh, throwing trash away. but. I'd like to be able to promote the needs of the park. Okay, thank you for stepping forward to volunteer. Alderman Thibault. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, so thank you, uh, Matthew, for, for coming forward, stepping forward on this. We got to, to meet over at, I think it was the town hall for Ward 3, um, the mayor's town hall, and uh, we had a long, fairly long conversation between you and with your dad since I knew your father, getting to work with him a long time ago, probably when you were very young if you were even born that's how old I am now um, and it was a great conversation and you talked about a lot about your advocacy and how you wanted to get more involved in things of the city and you know as soon as the mayor walked by rushing by trying to get to dinner I grabbed him and said talk to Matthew um, so um, I'm glad that you're, you're coming forward here and, and doing something for the city and this could be you know the start of you getting involved in a lot of different things here and uh, so I thank you I appreciate it um, we need everyone, you know, to do something, and it's great that um, you found something that interests you and something that, you know, you, you really can uh, to, to make better. So, thank you. Alderman Clemens. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for coming forward and stepping forward and providing your 
knowledge of the park um, <clears throat> and your love of the park and your love of Nashua. Um, it's great to see um, folks step up, especially when they have that, that knowledge and that um, desire. So I appreciate that and I wish you all the success. All set. All right, thank you, Mr. Roscoe. We'll take up your nomination later in the evening. Okay, uh, next up we have the Greeley Park Advisory Committee. Uh, Francis Murphy, new appointment, term to expire May 23, 2026, 72 Berkeley Street, Nashville, New Hampshire, 03064. Mr. Murphy's on Zoom. All Mr. right, Mayor, well, um, I, I am uh, introdu introducing and nominating uh, Fran Murphy to the uh, Greeley Park Advisory Committee. Now, this, <coughs> this is a committee created, uh, modeled after, created recently, modeled after the Mine Falls Park Advisory Committee, those being our two major parks in the city. Uh, the, one of the nominees, according to the uh, ordinance creating the committee, the advisory committee, it must be or should be a, affiliated with the Lower Merrimack River Local Advisory Committee. That's a uh, group of uh, people who counsel the state and others regarding the Merrimack River, actually, which of course mine falls abuts. Ex excuse me, Greeley <coughs> Park abuts. Uh, Fran is a longtime resident of the city. Uh, he is currently uh, with, and has been for quite a while, the f law firm of Shaheen and Gordon, uh, which has recently established a downtown office at the corner of uh, Pearl and Maine. Thank you very much. That's a big help to the downtown. Uh, he has been interested in Greeley Park for a long, long time and uh, has played a central role in, in uh, uh, making sure uh, that uh, the park is uh, protected uh, in the past. <coughs> so I am very happy to be nominating uh, Mr. Murphy, Attorney Murphy. Uh, and I think the connection with the Lower Merrimack River Advisory Committee is a, is a good idea and is a strong one. And therefore, <coughs> he will play an important part, uh, important role on the Greeley Park Advisory Committee. And I see, I see that Mr. Murphy is on the Zoom, so I'll ask him to say a few words about himself and uh, of his interest in the Greeley Park Advisory Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor uh, and Madam Chairperson. This is, uh, my name's Francis Murphy. I live at 72 Berkeley Street, which that is at the dead end of Berkeley Street. There is a stone wall that separates my property to Greeley Park. Uh, I am presently the chairman of the Lower Merrimack River Local Advisory Committee. I've been a part of that committee for about five plus years. And um, as the mayor indicated, uh, the um, part of the park abuts the river. Uh, it's on the other side of the railroad track, so a lot of the, our fellow citizens don't know that our uh, park extends to the river. And one of our members, my, my, my prior chairman, um, was active in promoting the boat ramp that's been rebuilt at the, that's Gene Porter at, at the, um, by the river in, in Greeley Park. So um, not only do I live next door to it, but I, I, I'm very proud to have been associated from the beginning with the Santa in the Park um, movement. We, every December, a bunch of the North End residents, we come together and we put on this affair to invite people to come and get a picture of Santa Claus. Um, my wife at the time, Amelda, was instrumental in forming it. She was. She was, this, she was the inspiring force to form it. And the idea was, instead of having to go to the uh, Pheasant Lane Mall and spend $75 for a picture with Santa, you should have, kids should have the ability to have a picture with Santa um, without paying anything. And that's what we've been doing every year for 13, 14 years. I'm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, I'm a member of the Friends of Greeley Park, and we've, our, our um, sort of, if you will, genesis and our, our interest in Greeley Park is to preserve it. Uh, to, it's, it's, it's been a gift from prior generations, and we don't want to have it cluttered with other things that really, 
know, one little different thing added to the part, uh, you know, maybe that doesn't matter, but when it starts accumulating, it, we lose the total impact of what is a uh, the jewel of, of the crown of the, of the park system in, in Nashua. So um, that's, that's, I'd like to continue to be involved, to be a, a voice for preserving what's best about Greeley Park and otherwise advising the Board of Aldermen um, on any kind of legislation that affects the park. Th that's what we do at the Lower Merrimack River Local Advisory Committee. We have no authority. All we can do is send comments to the, the, to the um, Department of Employment of uh, Environmental Services as to a project that may have an impact on the river. So uh, we're a voice and advocacy for the river. I'd like to be part of the voice that advocates for Greeley Park. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Are there questions from the committee? Alderman Clemens. Not a, uh, not a question, but again, I, I wanna thank you very much for stepping forward. Um, it's, uh, again, I think your expertise serving um, in particular with the river, I think is going to be beneficial, particularly because, you know, you'll, you have that foundation of, of knowing um, about the boat ramp and that aspect of, of the park. And also, I think just living in the neighborhood and, and doing your association there. So I really appreciate what you bring to the table, and I think you'll serve our city well. So thank you very much. Other thank you. Other comments or questions from the committee or other aldermen? Uh, I would just add thank you for your willingness to serve and the work that you're doing for the river. It sounds like you're very passionate and Greeley is a true gem in our city. So I know if, that- if I, if I could just add, I, I don't want to be, um, I'm sorry I'm not there in, in person. I've been exposed to COVID, uh, and the traveling companion from that of, my, of mine is positive for COVID. I just don't want to be a potential exposing anybody else to it. So that that's why I'm not present in the chamber, and I wish I could be, but I'm trying to be cautious. But thank you for your patience. Thank you for your concern. I hope that you stay healthy as well, Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up is a reappointment for uh, Judith Carlson uh, with a uh, term to expire April 14th, 2026. I do not have the address though, so. Reappointment to the National Arts Commission. Oh yeah, National Arts Commission, sorry. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'm glad to be appoint reappointing uh, Ms. Carlson to the National Arts Commission because over a long period of time, she has been a major contributor to the vitality of Nashua's art scene. Uh, we know that the arts are important to the life of any community and uh, also add to the uh, economic uh, vibrancy of a city uh, and in attracting uh, in new residents and in um, uh, the quality of life of those of us who already live here. Now I cannot go through, we don't really have time for me to go through everything that uh, Ms. Carlson has done regarding the arts. Most recently, uh, she has been one of the leaders of the effort to establish and design and shepherd the uh, Nashua Center for the Arts uh, to its completion uh, and was a major contributor to some of the ideas that were incorporated in that Nashua Center for the Arts, which is turning out to be a major success, I think, given the attendance that you're seeing there. Um, she was uh, instrumental in helping the, ch the city achieve and be awarded the governor's uh, award uh, for, the, for the arts, uh, community supporting the arts. Creative community. Creative community, which is good for three years. Um, that is awarded technically by the State Council on the Arts, called the Governor's Award, and we got that as a result of uh, much of the work that Ms. Carlson did. Um, she has uh, res w raised the funds to establish and then restore uh, the, sh the um, Aponovich mural, which is on the building uh, just across the street and is leading the effort to re again restore that and incorporate it within the Nashua Center for the Arts. Uh, she has raised uh, the money to 
uh, restore the very significant mural that is in the Court Street building. Uh, and that is by, and apolog I apologize for the artist. <laughs> anyway, a, a very significant woman um, Lucien muralist. Block. Yeah, Lucienne Block. Block, a very significant uh, female muralist, uh, nationally known. Uh, and in many other ways, which she can discuss, has uh, contributed to the art scene in our city for a long, long time. So she certainly is a great addition to the National Arts Commission, and I'm glad to be reappointing her. And I will let uh, Ms. Carlson address, say a few things about herself if she wishes and, and uh, speak of her interest in the arts and of uh, her participation on the National Arts Commission. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me here. And it was good to see Fran Murphy being uh, nominated for that post because Although his wife Imelda did come up with the idea and ran for many years, uh, he has taken over in her spot. And every year he's out there and brings all the accoutrements that she had collected from his house every year. And it wouldn't happen without him as well. And it's just a wonderful addition to the holiday scene here at Nashville. My husband and I have been participating in it from day one, too, and it's just great fun. Um, as far as I, you know, I worked at a very intense job in corporate America for many years. I've lived in Nashua since 1973, so that makes it my 50th anniversary. And although I was not born and raised here, I maybe live here longer than some of you are. Uh, uh, but, you know, even how old some of you are. Uh, but um, we raised our daughter here, and she went to the national school system before moving on to uh, Boston, Co College, Boston University and then out into the world on her own. And we would love someday for our daughter to come back here. <clears throat> Excuse me, she's now living overseas. Uh, her husband's a retired Air Force colonel, and they're looking at coming back, and hopefully they will land here in Nashville because she loves the city as well. But um, I started volunteering in the arts in 1983 as part of my job at Digital Equipment Corporation because at that time, Digital was the largest donor to what was then Nashua Symphony and always had someone on their board. And I became that board person for about three or four years and then really was not that active in volunteering until 1998 when I transferred from full-time corporate work to part-time consulting and got really involved around 2010, I think. And have, you know, I have been on the Historic District Commission. Uh, I've been on the, the Hunt Memorial Building, had a nonprofit associated with it for a while. And I was one of the founding members of that. That's where I met Mary Goyette, who got me really involved in the arts. <laughs> She's a very convincing woman. <clears throat> and we had a great uh, synergistic relationship because she was getting a little older and needed somebody to help her who could get out there and get things done. And I was that kind of person. And then I was on the board of City Arts in Nashua for five years. That's where I did a lot of the work on not only restoring the Yankee Flyer Diner and Margaret's View of Nashua murals, but also the first one I worked on was um, Vivian's Dream, the big mural, right, which is now right next to the Performing Arts Center, and raised the money to the Arts <coughs> Nashua to do that as well. So um, at the same time, City Arts Nashua was very involved in Art Walk, and I got to know many of the artists in the city uh, through working as the artist uh, liaison for Art Walk every year. So when the mayor asked me to be on the Arts Commission, I was more than happy to do that. Um, at the same time, I, that's about the time I went off the, I'm no longer, and I have not been on City Arts National Board for some time, but I've been on the Arts Commission 
and I have chaired some of their committees. We were very active before COVID. We're starting to come back again, but I had chaired the, um, and I still chair through this year, the grants committee. And I also have chaired the workshop committee and we do uh, collaborative arts meetings every year. And I also chair that. So I've been very active on the committee, the, uh, on the commission the whole time I've been there and was very involved in writing the <coughs> current plan that was just approved by the Board of Aldermen. So um, I enjoy the work. It fits right into my background because I spent 30 years in marketing, communications, and public relations in Fortune 50 companies and gave me some way to follow my passion. And my husband says it's turned into a full-time job once I got involved with the now National Center for the Arts. It's hard not to call it the Performing Arts Center, but since I've been involved in there and I've been one of the founding members of um, National Community Arts, which is the nonprofit that helped raise the money and continues to raise the money to support that. Um, uh, National Community Arts has taken the lead and collaborated with the Arts Commission on running the gallery. Uh, the Sandy Clary Gallery was not something that was in the wheelhouse of spectacle management, and they were looking for somebody else to run it. So I um, recruited Carol Broby, another Arts Commission member who is an artist herself, and she's chairing the steering committee and helped her set everything up for that. It's, it's now had our first call for artists. We've had two exhibits there right now. There's 48 students from the city of Nashua displaying their art there as the annual student art exhibit. And we're about to select um, 12 artists, four for each of three more rotations that will run through next year when the student artists will have theirs again. So I've been very involved in the commission. I really enjoy the work and would love to be reappointed. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, one thing we have not yet mentioned is the International Sculpture Symposium, mm -hmm. So, which just closed. We just uh, closed right. that on Sunday. Ms. Carlson has been very active with that <coughs> for a long time on the board of directors. Well, I'm not on the board. Um, well, has sponsored some of the sculptures, meaning has helped pay for them. Also has been a host family uh, a number of years. So each of the artists stays with a family in Nashua. Recently, this just, just uh, maybe up until yesterday, they might have left yesterday, um, the Ukrainian artist, from originally from Poland, uh, Anna Rosinska, uh, stayed with Ms. Carlson and her husband. Uh, and she said, you know, it was a wonderful place to stay. And previous artists have been there as well. So as you can see, Ms. Carlson in many ways has been uh, very active and supportive of the art scene and uh, therefore, um, you know, is a great, a great participant on the Arts Commission. Thank you. And thank you for your willingness to come in. It has been uh, the request of the committee to start to do a little bit more um, interviewing when it comes to reappointments, because sometimes we may not have been sitting in this committee when you were com when you were put on the committee, and uh, we also don't get a whole lot of uh, purview into what all the committees are doing. So I appreciate you taking your time out. I know you have been very involved. So I'm going to open it up to questions from the committee. All right, we have Alderman Tebow, then Alderman Lopez. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Um, so. I think only maybe myself and, and Alderman Jetty have been here longer. Um, and you know, not that me and Alderman Jetty are the same age, but you know, we're close. Um, but I think you know, Rich Lannon and um, Mary Lou Blaisdell get a, a ton of credit for the Performing Arts Center, but I, rightfully so, but I believe your name's right there with them. Um, and I don't think you get enough credit for all the work you've done there. And so I appreciate that. I think uh, the Performing Arts Center is a great place. I'm looking forward to going there in a couple weeks to see a show, and I think um, the work you guys did on that. I mean, we, we had to come out of COVID, and in a city like ours, in a city that wants to thrive, it takes a lot of different things, and one of them is having an arts, an arts you know, culture. And if we don't have that, that that's one of those things that, that make or break a city. And I think, um, you know, 
you being part of that and helping it thrive is something, uh, you know, it makes me proud to be a Nashwin and to, um, to see that. You know, 100 years ago, we had mo movie theaters and regular theaters on Main Street. Um, I actually got to go to a movie theater on Main Street before it closed in the mid-70s, so um, the last one. So I know that, you know, we can bring that back to, to Nashua, and I think you've, you, you've helped do that. And so I appreciate it. I fully support your reappointment uh, on, on the National Arts Commission and um, look forward to seeing what you guys do, more things that you do um, to continue to, to, to make the city great. So thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to say that very well deserved and as well as Deb Novotny and we had a great team and you know it's like the four of us were kind of together at the hip and not to say anything about the rest of the members of the team they were there too uh, that the whole National Community Arts has done a phenomenal job I, I can say that for all my other team members and it's rare having volunteered with many other nonprofit volunteer groups it's rare when you get more than one or two people who do all the work on a nonprofit board. And we had a board that was just, we have a board that's really, truly amazing. Yeah, and I know Deb well, so sorry, Deb. Uh, I'll put you in there, too. <laughs> Good. Alderman Lopez, then Alderman Clemens. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I called uh, Ms. Carlson to ask to her to attend um, this morning. So I want to start by thanking you for being so responsive on short notice. Um, particularly because it is unusual to ask somebody to come in for a reappointment. You've, you've been vetted, cleared, you've served on the committee, you've volunteered for the city. Um, so I think it is important for us as a committee to be in touch with those, uh, or as a, an alternate committee, to be in touch with the, the volunteer committees that we appoint. And as um, Alderman Kelly said, we, we find out what's happening from people who are new and don't necessarily know the ins and the outs and don't necessarily have the full experience of those committees, it is a good idea for us to, to hear from the more experienced and more involved members too. And the reappointment to me seems like a good time to do that. Um, I was particularly confident, I knew you were gonna show up even though there was short notice because your commitment to the city does speak very plainly to itself. Um, during our conversation, I was a little taken aback that we really haven't formally acknowledged the role that you play in so many different areas. So I wanna make sure that the public has a chance to see, I mean, even this brief snapshot of the different things that you've been involved in, that you have done a lot for the city and we are very grateful for what you've contributed and the way that you've contributed to the larger art scene in Nashville. Because we're very quick to point to Nashville's vibrancy and the opportunities for people to express themselves artistically, but there are a lot of people who work behind the scenes to get that done. And not all of the jobs are as fancy as, you know, the artists. And I know particularly grant writers and administrators, artists can't, can't move without them. They need somebody to help them, uh, you know, navigate the more complex administrative systems so that they can focus on their art. And they need opportunities to be caught and, and brought in as much as they can earn their own, um, their own way in terms of inspiration, in terms of craftsmanship, there also needs to be that, that general support. And it's not a fun job. It's not an easy role to have. So I wanted to start by expressing appreciation to you for doing the job. And I wanted to make sure that you, you hear from us in the chamber that we appreciate the work you do. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for those kind of remarks. But even the, you know, the Arts Commission, our arts community here is rather unique and uh, very strong. You know, there was a reason that we were awarded the governor's award for the most creative community in the whole state, because we do have a very strong arts community here. It's not just me, it's many others. It's all the boards I've worked on have worked as a team. But I think you make a very good point is that places like the Arts Commission need to have a variety of the backgrounds of people who are on it, not just artists, because artists can speak for projects and everything else that is happening in the community, and we do even on the Arts Commission. We have some of the executive directors from some of our arts organizations on it, but we also need people from the community who are not artists and who have some of the other skills needed to make sure that 
things move forward, plans can be made, and ideas can come forward because you're 100% right. Not all artists have those skills that are concentrated on their art. And we need to make sure that when appointments are coming up for places like the Arts Commission, that we have a broad base of people who, can, with different skill sets, that can come forward and help. And I think that's one of the reasons why National Community Arts is, has been so successful, is we did that when we formed that nonprofit. Alderman Lopez. I think um, if people only looked at the direct roles, and we probably wouldn't have elected a nurse to Board of Public Works. But at the same time, if you look beyond the person's career occupation or skill set and to what they can bring to the table in terms of their perspective, you get a much more diverse and well-rounded board. And on that topic, because we do pride ourselves on being a, a welcoming city, um, can you talk a little bit about the, the opportunities that are available for uh, the BIPOC community and the different underserved populations in Nashua and how the Nashua Arts Commission is is looking for their support, their engagement, their participation? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, another thing that I have been doing that I didn't mention is um, we are in the process right now of doing a full-blown America for the Arts, AEP6, which stands for Arts uh, and Economic Prosperity, which is basically a survey that's happening across the United, entire United States of over 750 cities, and they do this every five years, and six, as you can do the math, it's over 30 years, and plus a couple because of COVID, it was supposed to happen in 2020. And there's a real strong BIPOC focus in the uh, surveying we're doing now. Um, I've had some difficulty locating members of the BIPOC community. I, of course, we all know about Plaza Street Arts, and uh, this survey has been focused on arts nonprofits, and also even the Arts Commission is very focused on arts nonprofits as well. And I think we are pretty sure that we have found all the arts nonprofits because they're listed by the state. But to find all the other areas where we can include diversity in what we do is very difficult because many of our uh, communities aren't that forthcoming and don't come up and say they want to be part of things. We've had openings on the Arts Commission now for over a year, and it's hard to get people to even fill those positions. One of the things we did do is when, with the new gallery and what we're doing with the call for artists there, we made sure that we included the survey of what the ethnic that and uh, cultural backgrounds are as part of the survey, because we're trying to make it as diverse and reflective as possible of our city, and that's even part of the goal that's stated in the plan for the art gallery, is to have it reflect Nashua's, uh, the most diverse city in, in New Hampshire. We're always, you know, looking for and welcoming, and, but I like even communicating with the, I hate to say this, but the Multicultural Commission, I've contacted them twice, and I think somebody from the mayor's office contacted them, asking me to fill out the sur survey for you know the festival that we do every year, and got no response. So it's something we are continuing to focus on and look at and work on. Alderman Lopez, follow up. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, you were specifying, because this is a survey, and survey instruments have to be used a specific way or the data they generate is worthless. Um, and it is driven by grant funding. So when you say BIPOC um, nonprofit organizations, like we have a member of this board who is represents the BIPOC community and has a, a business that associates with art, but that's not a nonprofit. And I mean, I, I involved impact organization that I'm president of has BIPOC representation, but we're not an arts organization. So when we say we're looking for a BIPOC uh, run or representative nonprofit organization, that can be very much misconstrued. We <coughs> can assume that there is, um, you know, ignorance of, of certain communities, but they're not necessarily um, using the terminology exactly the same. And I think it's important to engage members of the community so that artists and people who are involved in nonprofit organizations that represent the arts and our members of the BIPOC community 
are able to know that their voices are heard and that their contributions are welcome and that is part of our city. And I also think it's equally here important to hear the people saying, we're looking for you to come to us and we're looking for you to, you're invited to our house, come, come to our meetings, because if, if we don't meet in the middle, then we have separate communities and we're not the welcoming community we wanna be. So I appreciate your work in that area because I know it's thankless and I know it's easier to, um, to point to all of the things that are, are successes and it's more exciting to be you know, kind of the headliner, but there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and I know you've been a large part of it. Um, so I appreciate you coming to the committee to update us on some of the priorities that the Arts Commission has and to make sure that communities hear that they are welcome. That's the goal, yes. Was that Alderman Lopez? Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? Alderman Clemens. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I just wanted to briefly just thank you. It was fast. This conversation tonight has been fascinating, and your history here in Nashua uh, is equally um, as fascinating to me. So I, um, <clears throat> I, I just want to thank you for all that you do and all that you have done and all that you will do. And the only other comment I'm going to say is, I too went to a movie theater on Main Street, though it was further down. It was the Brant, and it was in, uh, it, but it was still on Main Street. All right, so I, I, I got that. True. <laughs> anyway. True. The Brant. Same here. All set, Alderman Clemens. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that is all you have tonight, right? Mr. Law said he was unable to attend, so we'll have him at our next meeting. Pardon? Uh, Mr. Law says he was unable to attend this evening, yes. so we'll have to bring him up at the next one. So we'll bring him back next time. That's it, right? Okay. So, Madam Chair, I was, if you don't mind, I was going to stay to discuss the two ordinances that you have. Pending. You're always welcome. New business. <laughs> no, leave the city hall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> Application to license hawkers, peddlers. It, 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 I can't speak today in that word. Itinerant. Then, itinerant? <laughs> Vendor's license. Uh, there are none. Appointments by the mayor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to recommend the following appointment from alternate to member to the Conservation Commission, uh, Richard Widhu, with a term to expire December 31st, 2025. I do them all at once. So do you oh, individually? Sure. Uh, I'd like to make a, another motion to recommend um, a new appointment to the Greeley Park Advisory Committee for Francis Murphy. Uh, with term to expire May 23rd, 2026. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to recommend the following reappointments to the Hunt Memorial Building Board of Trustees, Rosalie M. McQuaid, with a term to expire 31, 2025, or 26, uh, and William J. Dubois, Jr., with a term to expire January 31st, 2028. Um, I'd also like to make a motion to recommend uh, the following new appointment to the Mine Falls Advisory Committee, Matthew Roscoe, Roscoe with a term to expire May 9th, 2026. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to recommend uh, reappointment to the National Arts Commission, Judith Carlson, with a term to expire April 14th, 2026. And I'd like to make a motion uh, for the following reappointments to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, Steve Lionel, with a term to expire September 30th, 2025, and Jonathan Jack M. Courier, with a term to expire September 11th, 2025. We've heard the motion. Is there any discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you for coming in. And we will swear you in at the next Board of Aldman meeting. All right. Unfinished business. There is none. New business resolutions. There is none. New business ordinances. Uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, to recommend final passage of O-23-053, designating the Public Health and Community Services Division Director as the Chief Public Health Official of the City. And I would like uh, Director Bagley to come on up, if she would. Please. Just going to say the same thing. <coughs> <coughs> Um, the ordinance uh, as proposed designates the director of public health and community services in, in, in this case uh, 
uh, Director Bobby Bagley as the chief public health official of the city. Now, with Director Bagley in that position, uh, it's clear that uh, in reality, she is the chief public health officer of the city. Um, her responsibilities cross, you know, many, t cross and touch on many public health issues. Uh, not only uh, the uh, recent COVID uh, issues that we had o over a period of years, uh, she was the leader there, uh, but also the opioid crisis uh, in the, in that role, she's played, a, in her position, she's played a big role there. Uh, in the homeless, the problem, which is largely a mental health and um, substance abuse health, public health issue, uh, is very, been very active with uh, that, with the homeless population and in trying to fashion a different and more innovative approach towards our homeless population, which uh, she's working on now with a lot of other people. Uh, including visiting and talking with many of the people that are uh, living outside uh, and making sort of extensive observations regarding that, working with nonprofits to improve the city's response. Uh, all of the grants that we receive uh, from the state and the federal government, of course, are managed by Director <coughs> Bagley uh, and Certainly, there are other public health issues, STDs, uh, immunization, you know, various uh, issues that uh, Director Bagley can address. So my point is uh, she is clearly acting as the chief public health official of the city. Now, in the past, I think when this ordinance was originally passed and designated uh, the, the head of environmental health as the chief public health official. Uh, we did not have someone with Director Bagley's medical expertise uh, and background in this position. Uh, the, some of the previous uh, uh, people who've held this position did not have nursing or medical degrees of any kind. Uh, Director Bagley, of course, uh, has a master's in nursing uh, is uh, working on her doctorate. She's on the board, one of the boards of uh, Southern New Hampshire Medical Center. She's <laughs> very active uh, in, I can't, she can tell you everything, but many, many organizations statewide. Uh, and with, with someone with her level of expertise in this position, it is only fitting that we declare her as the chief public health official of the city. One more point, Madam Chair. Uh, in trying to get grants, and uh, Director Bagley can address <coughs> this in more detail, in a number of instances when we've been dealing with uh, grant, uh, granting agencies, agencies that give the city grants, uh, they are very puzzled by the fact that uh, she is not the chief public health official of the city. And at times it has made uh, negotiations and discussions regarding awarding the city grants more difficult because they expect the chief public health office official of the city to be in charge of uh, seeking and supervising the grant. Uh, so also in the kind of the grant area, it's important that we have uh, someone with this level of medical, this level of expertise uh, and this background uh, who's actually in charge designated as the chief uh, public health official. So uh, I don't know uh, if Director Bagley has other um, thoughts she would like to express, but certainly in terms of some of the difficulties that the city and you specifically have had in the, the area of, uh, of, uh, of applying for and being awarded and accepting grants. Director Bagley, do you want to speak to that or take questions? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, sorry, I have no voice. Bobby Bagley, Director for the City of Nashville, Division of Public Health and Community Services. In this uh, request for this change, um, the title of the uh, director um, was pointed out by one of the organizations that we applied for funding as not um, really 
um, describing uh, the, the position by the title. Um, and as the mayor was saying, it was, for the, it was the Kresge Foundation grant that we were applying for, and it asked for the chief, um, it asked for the health official. And so in the application as the lead with the title director, it was unclear that that was my role as the chief, um, help the, the chief uh, public health official. And so this request is to um, change that title that actually reflects me in that role. The, um, the HR director had to submit something in writing that actually clarified that the director was the lead of the Division of Public Health and Community Services. So this role does uh, specify that specifically. In other states, the um, director or the lead of the health department is the chief public health official. And so this request is to make that synonymous with other uh, positions, other, my position the same as other positions in other places with that title on it. So it does designate that as the lead. The, the job description for uh, the director hadn't been updated since 2008. And so this also update, updates the, um, the job description for the chief public health official as well. Okay. And I have to say, <clears throat> in fairness to um, Director Bagley, that she has done an incredible job as Director of Public Health and Community Services, the COVID, the, opioid, the opioids. You wouldn't believe what she's doing now with the homeless population down by the river, you know, on, over the weekend, talking to people, assessing their problems, helping us to develop um, a more effective response to getting many people who are involved with substance abuse into housing and treatment. So I think it's in addition to all these other reasons, it is only fair to Director Bagley that she be given uh, officially the title of uh, Chief, Chief Public Health Officer of Nashville. Alderman Tebow, then Alderman Clemens. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't speak in the words of the great Alderman uh, Mel Moran and say that uh, unsheltered. Um, and uh, we should probably uh, get used to the term maybe substance misuse. I, I like to use that term too. Um, that's something that try to get the stigma out of that. Um, but I think Director Bagley, um, having to come out of COVID and you're still here is something, um, you know, an amazing feat in itself. Um, that was a tough, t tough thing to get through, and you certainly—it was a thankless job, I'm sure, during that time, as you got opinions from everyone about what they think we should do with COVID, regardless of what was the science, what wasn't the science, and for you to have to deal with that and get through it during that time, and you're still here working for us in Nashua, it is great. And so I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what I've seen from you, and and you know, I. I Expect that there'll be more on the unsheltered and more about the opioid um, abuse situations coming because it's a problem and it's something that, that uh, uh, we need to fix and we need to continue to work on. So uh, I agree with changing that if it helps us get, makes your job easier so that we can get more money and we can do business better in the city when it comes to this stuff, the health of our city, then I'm all for changing that. Um, I don't see an issue with it. And so I just wanted to thank you for everything you're doing and uh, I'll support this. Thank you. Alderman Clemens. Thank you. I was uh, <clears throat> very excited to see this come forward and that's, I was very proud to co-sponsor this legislation because I can think of no one in this city who would better fit this role. Um, you do a tremendous job for the citizens of Nashua, especially um, those who, um, live on the fringes and are unfortunate um, to not have a place to live, to, to live out in the elements and things like that. So um, you help our most vulnerable population every day. It's something that I admire, um, <clears throat> not something that I'm, I would be able to do uh, on a daily basis and not go home and, and, and just be devastated by it. So I don't know how like you and Tom, I know, you know, do that, but um, every day, but I admire those that do. And um, 
you know, I just want to thank you for, for everything that you've done for our city. For as long as I've been an alderman, you've always been there and been guiding the ship. And, and so this is, I think, well-deserved and uh, I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Alderman Lopez. Um, so with respect to the mayor, I recognize that you're trying to introduce Director Bagley's qualifications and trying to give an elevator pitch on the causes of homelessness in the region is a little bit of a challenge. Um, welcome to that side of the world. Um, I would just, I, I have to point out that homelessness is not just substance use and it's not just mental illness. Those are prevalent among the homeless population, but a lot of the uh, reason that they're so prevalent beyond the trauma associated with being unsheltered and the challenges of trying to interface with a world that you don't have access to the same basic supplies that everybody else around you has is, is that those systems right now are very much strained, struggling, if not overtly broken. Um, when we look at homelessness, it's the mental health crisis can be directly correlated with a lack of resources or available uh, interventions. It can be directly traced to um, a lack of available and consistent approaches to uh, recovery and substance use, misuse education. Um, when we start trying to uh, utilize the words properly, we start to discover things like caffeine can be misused and it's in the DSM. You can have a whole um, caffeine use issue. Um, so we're a society where everybody does as they do while saying to do otherwise. And the people who are out on the fringes, so to speak, are being held to a different standard while not necessarily being given any kind of an avenue with which to come back. One of the things that I thought was uh, very impactful for the safe station was when you encouraged people who were struggling with during the opioid crisis by telling them that there is a path forward. And that's what I think is important to remember when we're talking about people who are unsheltered, people who are homeless, people who are struggling with any kind of housing insecurity, mental health, or substance uh, use disorder, is there is a path forward. And in offering that path, we have to be, as a local government and as different departments of the city government, we have to be willing to open those doors and be willing to allow that path forward. Now, as the topic is Director Bagley, I would like to point out that she has put a tremendous amount of work into opening those doors, particularly in the area of community education and in addressing systems processes. I know you didn't write the book on public health, but you definitely taught out of it for many years. And that has created a highly qualified and highly experienced um, public health department. In addition, um, I think you've also shown, particularly over the uh, opioid crisis and the COVID epidemic, that being able to pull the resources together means our city performs much, much more effectively. So to that end, and if you're comfortable, since there are six uh, aldermen here, um, would you maybe give an example, like a recent example of where you've had to show leadership to get a grant that maybe there hasn't been a lot of time to go through the proper um, administrative channels or maybe those administrative channels have had different priorities, but now you have to lead. Now you have to step up and say, this is important for our community. Uh, yes, Alderman Lopez, thank you. So at this particular time, we have um, an opportunity to um, have more funding for um, additional work that needs to continue. Um, over the past few years, we've been um, working really closely with the state to address um, our emergent response to, to COVID with regards to um, mitigation efforts. And now we're in a post-COVID period where we, have, we <coughs> see the, um, the impact that this um, pandemic has had on many in our community. And as mentioned, uh, those that are um, in, the, in a situation where they're you know, unstably housed, um, unsheltered, homeless, um, rough sleepers, sleeping just out on the sidewalk. I mean, we have, we have individuals that are sleeping in tents and we have some that are just right, just out on the concrete. Um, and so we have an opportunity to get some additional funding for um, you know, another year to address these issues head on. And so um, one of the things that I was able to do was to write a proposal for how we're going to 
address this for the next fiscal year with a, with a very specific focus on um, looking at how we respond to the pandemic, what's come out of it as far as the, um, the post-pandemic impact on these vulnerable populations, which includes seniors as well, um, and uh, many of our youth as a result of the isolation or quarantine are still dealing with the impact of that now and are having um, issues with being able to sustain themselves or cope in schools and now um, coming back into uh, situations where they're gathered together. And so having the opportunity to advocate for that and write that proposal to the state, which we've gotten that additional um, funding for, um, that will be presented to you all next week, which I'm hoping will kind of move that through relatively quickly. Um, but there's, there's the opportunity where that adaptive leadership needs to be there to even you know, speak with the state about how we need to be able to respond to these issues at the local level with them as, a, with, with them as our partner, but allowing for us to be able to, to respond in a way that will work for us down here in Nashville and the greater Nashville region. So I hope that answers um, your question, Alderman Lopez. Follow up. If I can just clarify, the, so with the safe station, the key was having a door open when somebody had the need and the desire to seek change. Similarly, with the unsheltered populations, we need shelter capacity, we need space. Um, and similarly, in our own systems right here, Director Bobley, Bagley and the Public Health Department can answer the needs of the nonprofits that are serving people in the community if we as aldermen are able to look at the upcoming um, ordinance and take the necessary action. We don't have, and I apologize to the chair for kind of backdoor introducing this. I just realized there was enough people here that we should probably bring it up. We don't have a human affairs committee um, meeting in the timeline that they're gonna need, which is why we're probably gonna have to take specific action. But that's something that Director Bagley reached out to me as soon as she was aware we needed to do that. And that's, that's what we need in a chief public health officer, somebody who's willing to see uh, solutions to an unfolding crisis and take the actions that are necessary and mobilize the people. So I encourage you all to look for that communication and look at that piece of legislation when it comes up uh, for the next Board of Alderman meeting and to support Director Bob Lee's, uh, Bagley's um, nomination. Thank you. Alderman Lopez. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, I want to echo all of the comments. Oh, did, did I miss a hand over here? Alderman Jetty, go ahead. Uh oh, thank you. I, I'd be happy to wait for you. But um, so I, you know, I, I'm in complete agreement about uh, Director Bagley's qualifications and everything that's been said about her. I uh, worked closely with her during the COVID uh, crisis and prior to that. Uh, you know, when I, when I tried to uh, get us to increase the age at which people in Nashville could buy tobacco to 21. She was also very helpful to me, although we were not successful, but eventually the legislature had, did do that. Uh, but um, so I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement, um, you know, with all of this. Um, but I, uh, you know, during the, the COVID thing, uh, you know, I attended several uh, meetings of the Board of Health and uh, so I'm, I'm wondering about, uh, you know, since, since I've become an alderman, I'm, I'm constantly uh, fascinated when I read the city charter about uh, how difficult it is to understand how arcane the language is and how, uh, uh, you know, at first blush, it doesn't seem to be consistent with what we're doing as a city. And uh, you know, th this is you know, an example of, of something that you know that I raise uh, not 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 to uh, prevent Ms. Bagley from you know getting the, uh, the the title that she deserves, but I'm wondering if if we need to look at the charter and uh, and have the charter uh, reflect what we are doing as a city because. You know, the charter establishes a, uh, uh, a board of health, uh, a board of health to be elected by the board of aldermen. And the board of health, in turn, <coughs> appoints a health officer, elects a health officer. 
Um, when you look at the ordinances, the ordinances provide for um, you know a, a director of uh, health. I'm forgetting the, the uh, I'm forgetting the title. Um, Uh, director of the Division of Public Health and Community Services, uh, who's appointed by the mayor. And um, so I'm just, you know, I, I know during COVID, uh, you know, when, when I went to the Board of Health meetings, it was the Board of Health who made the decisions, who ran, ran the meetings, and uh, Ms. Uh, director Bagley was there, and. Um, you know, advise them, but they're the ones who, who made these decisions. Um, and, I, and I just, it seems like we have, you know, parallel uh, laws or ordinances or charter provisions, you know, regarding our, our Board of Health. And I'm wondering if um, it would make sense um, for, uh, the legal department or some special committee to, you know, to look at those provisions to, to make sure that we're, uh, that, that, uh, that they're consistent. <coughs> and, uh, you know, I just would be interested in know, knowing whether, the, whether the, the mayor has thought of that, whether he's looked into it and whether he has a response to, uh, you know, the questions that I raise. Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, well, of course, legal did clear this, but um, I mean, I know there's that role of the Board of Health in the Charter. I guess my thoughts are that the position of uh, public <coughs> Director of Public Health and Community Services is a broader position than the ch is a cons consists of more a broader group of responsibilities than does this uh, uh, provision in the city charter in terms of what the Board of Health uh, hires. Um, I suppose we could look at having them also endorse the, the, uh, the change to uh, suggest that uh, in this case, Bobby Bagley as Director of Public Health and Community Services would, would in their opinion, also be the pub Chief Public Health Officer of the city. I mean, there is some, I'd say that the ordinances as they exist now, even without this amendment, and the city charter, which of course it goes back 100 years or so, um, are not entirely consistent. And uh, I don't know how to resolve that, but the this position of uh, Director of Public Health and Community Services was, you know, created more like, you know, maybe in the 70s. And, uh, you know, it, again, is a broader position than that defined in the charter for the for the uh, for the the position that would report to the Board of Health. Okay, thank you. I only raised the question. I don't provide the answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, legal has looked at this. If you would like them to come in and kind of talk about that issue, um, I'm sure they'd be glad to do that. How's that, Alderman Chetty? Um, I'm not a member of this committee, so I, you know, um, I'll, I'll leave it to the committee to decide whether that is advisable or not. Okay. I was beginning to say that I echo a lot of the um, sentiments of my colleagues in terms of uh, the work that you're doing in our community and the work that you did through COVID, so thank you for that. Um, I also understand the intricacies of this being able to allow you to get some more grant funding for the great work that you're doing. Um, I'm going to support this, but I did have a question for Mr. Mayor as well. Um, you mentioned that the way that the um, Community Dis Services Division Director job description has been written, and it's it's pretty old. So my, my only concern here is 
Director Bagley fits this perfectly, but is it possible that 20 years from now we have someone who's a community services director who may not have the, qual the same qualifications and background as the chief public health officer? Um, I'd say that's possible. Now, we, we do have a revised job description here that would go along with this, but um, I'd say that's possible. But I, given, but I'm going to say, given the public health issues that exist, and given the <clears throat> precedent set by the tenure of Director Bagley, that it is unlikely that if a future director was chosen, that a person would be hired who had no background or expertise in the medical field. And so again, it's possible that such a person would be nominated, but uh, I'd say it's unlikely. And that could be clarified by requiring that, by ordinance, that the person have medical or you know nursing some sort of relevant uh, expertise and I mean it's you're right it should that should be a stated qualification of the job which but in the ordinance it really isn't mm -hmm. but it but it, uh, it, pro it given circumstances in 21st century New Hampshire and Nashua and the, the nation uh, probably it should require a public health back, a, a, a health-related background. Okay, thank you. Um, I could look into making that ordinance change and talking through that with whoever else might be interested in helping, but that was my one note, so thank you. Anyone else from the committee? Alderman Lopez, then Alderman Tebow. Uh, I know from personal awkward experience that any changes to the ordinances that pertain to the Board of Health have to go through referendum, um, and then I would also uh, propose that what we're, the mayor is doing here is more of a staffing and um, <coughs> supervision kind of a, a role rather than a matter of public health, which is more what the Board of Health deals with. Um, I think we should move forward with it today and make sure that everything's in place on our end, um, but then ask them to weigh in on it um, at their next meeting, which is the day after our Board of Aldermen meeting. Alderman Tebow? Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, that new job description, was that in the packet? No, well, we it, have a copy for you now. If you'd can, like. we, uh, can we get it so when we, when we vote on this for uh, Board yeah, of Aldermen that yeah, it's of part of the packet, please? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll give it some time. Accept it into the record. We actually accept it into the record. So I think I gave you about six copies, I think. Yeah, you gave me a ton of copies. Um, so um, I think i got to make a motion to, or oh, we're we still, still, we're still in the here. middle of the motion. Okay, we'll do that first. Well, yeah, let's finish the one in front of us. So the motion before us is to recommend final passage of 023053. Is there any additional com conversation around? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Go ahead and make your... All right. I'd like to make a motion to uh, put into record uh, the document that gives the new position description of the Chief Public Health Officer, uh, official director um, for the City of Nashua. The motion is to accept communication that was prepared after the agenda. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That goes into the record. Okay. We will go back to ordinances. All right. Um, I'd like to... Director Bagley. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion uh, for final passage of 0-23-054 relative to public comment. Okay. The motion before us is for final passage of 0-23-054. I assume there'll be some discussion on this motion. <laughs> oh. um, I know I didn't sponsor it. Maybe we should let them. <laughs> huh? Maybe uh, Alderman Gouveia wants to go first since he's a sponsor. And I also saw the mayor's hand up. Mm -hmm. Gouveia, then the mayor, then you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to say I'd be more than happy to speak, but if the mayor wants to go first, I would like to hear what he has to say about the legislation. Sure. Mr. Mayor? Uh, well, I think the, uh, the 
proposed ordinance creates you know, an interesting issue. So right now, our ordinances prevent or prohibit during public comment, and Sorry. I'm sure during the Board of Aldermen, I mean, no one would do this anyway, but crude, vulgar, profane, or obscene remarks. Now, that's what the ordinance says. So we got a letter from the ACLU, which I believe <coughs> you got a copy of raising the question of a decision made in Massachusetts concerning a situation uh, where there were uh, a prohibition on remarks uh, before a public body, a board of selectmen, I believe, as well as, you know, a factual, um, a factual uh, background that accompanied it. Now, uh, the case, the term they use in the law is the case is not really, quote, on point. What that means is it's not all that similar to what we have. Uh, number one, the language of the uh, rule or the ordinance in the Massachusetts case was much broader than this. It prohibited respect, it required that remarks be respectful and courteous free of rude, personal, or slanderous remarks. Now, the, you know, this concept of respectful and courteous, free of rude, personal, or slanderous remarks, that is a very broad, uh, um, a very broad ordinance, much broader than ours. Uh, number two, um, when this became an issue, it was because a citizen came forward and suggested that the city stop spending, stop breaking the open meeting law, uh, and criticized proposed budget increases, uh, saying that the town had been spending like a drunken sailor uh, and was in trouble, argued for a moratorium on hiring, and inquired about the benefits of hiring a town manager as opposed to whatever they had. Um, and you know that went on a little bit then suggested that the head of the board was, you know, should stop being like a Hitler. So they adjourned the meeting and came back and prohibited the person from speaking and said they would have her removed if she continued. Now, that has not happened here in the least. I mean, we've heard some fairly scathing <laughs> criticism of the board of aldermen of the city, whatever, uh, with, and that in no way is inconsistent with the rule that we have. So I, you know, the, the, because we got the letter and because we work with the ACLU in the past, we, you know, I, I and the city legal office met with them. Um, neither the ACLU nor anyone else has ever, has ever come forward with a case that suggested there is a First Amendment right to use obscene language during a public meeting. There's no case that anyone has found or that anyone has pointed to. Um, or profanity during a public meeting. So I think they did suggest that the, I mean, one problem that there can be with ordinances like this is that words that are ambiguous and can you know, have a very, um, you know, a lot of different meanings uh, would, you know, could be problematic. And if you look at the four terms, I think the two most, you know, I, our legal department believes that they could defend and successfully defend this ordinance. But uh, the two terms which probably are the most ambiguous or open to interpretation are crude and vulgar. Now, I think profanity, maybe the term should be profanity, and obscene remarks. I mean, I, I don't think, I, it's hard to believe that a court would say that you have a First Amendment right to walk in here and, and use obscenities, and use obscenities or profanity in the context of making public remarks. And certainly, there is no case that anyone has pointed to that suggests that. Um, the letter from the, uh, from the ACLU says that, uh, we, that we can require orderly and peaceable 
uh, of comments. Uh, so we can have legal come in to discuss this if you'd like. I guess my suggestion is that if the committee and the board wish, we could compromise this and delete the words crude and vulgar and simply prohibit profanity and obscene remarks. And were that challenged, you know, we, we don't know, you never know what's going to happen, but uh, certainly no one has pointed a case to a case that suggests that in a public meeting that's put on TV where children are sometimes present or listening, that profanity and obscenity are protected by the First Amendment. Okay. Now, maybe you want to think about this and not do anything tonight. I mean, this is not real urgent. Um, uh, we could have legal come in <coughs> if you'd like, give their thoughts. But, uh, you know, in sort of talking around, talking with people over the last day or two, you know, the idea, well, let's compromise this in some way. Um, you know, I don't think really anyone's looking, anyone here really wants profane profane, profanity or obscene remarks, uh, but people want to be consistent with the First Amendment, and uh, narrowing the language may help to achieve those goals. I have Alderman Gravea, then Alderman Lopez, then Alderman Debo, then you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So obviously the legislation came from the letter from the ACLU. And I think, uh, or really what I'm thinking and what was going through my head when I was asked to co-write this legislation with Alderman Camo and Alderman Sullivan was under the operating rules we have now is where we can not use language or profane, obscene, anything like that. You could be gaveled out of order. So. We did put it in there, and I, I supported when we put it in there. I supported the ordinance when we put it in there the first time. But knowing what I know now and seeing this letter here, it makes me think, well, do we really need it there? And we heard from the mayor that, yeah, the legal feels they could defend it, but is that something we want to roll the dice on, spend money on, and you never know which way it's going to go in, in court? Uh, I, I don't personally. I wouldn't really want to risk it when there's already protections in place based on the rules of order that we use. And it's one of those things exactly like the mayor just said, you want to protect the First Amendment, but at the same time, you also want to have decorum in, in politics and in the chamber here. So I think it's kind of a, it's a slippery slope. I would feel comfortable with removing this language, knowing that there's already protections in place, and then it just neutralizes any threat of any potential litigation that the city would have to go through at some point because as we know these get costly and can take up a substantial amount of time so that's really where i was coming from uh, when i signed on to the legislation obviously uh, it's up for debate so I, i'd be more than happy to hear what other aldermen have to say about it but at this time i would still feel that this ordinance should be passed as is alderman lopez uh, so, uh, first, regarding the letter, like I have respect for the ACLU as a, as a concept and institution. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with everything that they say or do. I think some of the, the public support for this has come from people who do, don't like free speech if it's not something that they want done in their particular venue or public uh, whatever. Um, There's a specific uh, example a couple of years ago where people didn't want um, story time with a trans person because the, that was putting ideas in people's heads. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of back and forth when it comes to exactly what free speech is. Um, and just because the ACLU has uh, a reputation and a mission and a purpose doesn't mean that, oh, no, we should undo everything we just did, our bad. Because we had a deliberation. We had public comment. We had our decision-making transparent and made in the public. And legal was advising us as to what we, we could and couldn't do. And if I recall, the primary purpose of it, at least in my mind, was to avoid getting nailed with, you know, uh, public um, television violations of, of profanities hitting the, the air when we didn't have time to actually stop it from happening. So, I mean, it, it seems kind of counterintuitive that on one side we could get nailed for a free speech violation, but on the other side we could get nailed for a speech violation. Um, so. 
I'm a little bit confounded by the ACLU's letter, purpose, and intent here. Um, I would almost love to have them come and explain in person as well, although I, I feel like they probably are more eager to write the letter than to show up and explain. Um, I do want to hear from um, the legal department directly, though, because I think um, for the ACLU to pinpoint two or three words out of our ordinance and say that these words are ambiguous and these are the magic, you know, rituals that summon lawyers, that seems a little bit arcane. And if we're going to go that way, I'd rather have the actual lawyers that represent the city and would defend it, explain it, rather than us try to ad hoc um, adjust. All that being said, um, I agree with Alderman Gouveia's um, impression as well that the legislation being proposed it seems fairly benign because it does it does retain the ability of a chair or presiding officer to ensure that public comment is on topic and on task. And I mean, that's part of what Mason's rules uh, guarantees. So I don't think we're necessarily gonna go too far astray. I'd hate to see the city get sued over um, free speech violations or anything like that, just because I assume that. So that's why I would rather hear from legal directly and have them come in and, and kind of walk through the best way to do this. Alderman Tiba, then Alderman Clemens. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, first question is, so we said we get a letter from the ACLU. So did the ACLU just start looking through our books and say, hey, uh, I'm seeing some crude and vulgar comments, language in here. I need to strike that. I mean, it just doesn't pop onto the ACLU's plate, right? And it's ACLU of Massachusetts, not even our ACLU, correct? Am, am I wrong on this? Um, well, no, it, the uh, gentleman who came in uh, is from New Hampshire, yes. Okay. It's like, I mean, somehow they became aware of the provision and therefore decided to send a letter. Okay, interesting follow-up. Um, so, a couple things on this. I mean, we all work, nothing's changed other than the ACLU letter since we originally went over this and we um, debated it and it was a debate. I remember having to try to explain to one alderman what crude and vulgar means or what we think it means. Um, so we got a, an email today, I wanted to read part of it because it, it, it goes against what we're really even trying to, 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 to do with this ordinance. Um, so here's, I'm not going to read it all, but um, I want to give a big thank you to Alderman John Sullivan, Alderman Alex Camo, and Alderman Tyler Govea for sponsoring 023-054 in order to give natural residents back their freedom of speech. As natural residents have seen in the past, some Board of Aldermen do not want to hear from any residents that do not agree with them. However, this is not a perfect world and residents are allowed to disagree with what our Aldermen are doing for their constituents. I can't remember one time that we've told, other than hearing the word that we don't want to hear over the airwaves, told somebody to stop speaking. I Whether did. You're not talking. I did. I don't care. Ms. Orlando. You're, that you're going against this, this ordinance right now no, by speaking out. I'm going to share it with you. So, as far as I've been here, we have not thrown anybody out of the, here for anything they've said. Alderman, former Alderman Teboom comes in here all the time and rips us, all the time. Nobody throws him out, he calls us imbeciles, um, even people who were probably in his party. He calls us imbeciles, stupid, ignorant. None of us throw him out. The chair, none of the chairs ever get rid of him, ever. We do have not limited free speech by this ordinance. Um, you know, one of my favorite people I disagree with, and I'm gonna say his name even though I'm not supposed to, Matthew Guthrow. I like the guy, but we don't agree on, on many things. He comes in here, sometimes he's harsh, but we never say what his words are against us. We never kick him out. And I talk to him afterwards. He seems like a nice enough guy, right? I have nothing against him. We don't limit free speech. It's a fallacy. It's a myth by a couple of people that want another suit so they can make a 14th or a 15th or a 16th suit against this city. I don't know why we would support these people, right? I mean, I think that, that, that this ordinance was, we approved it. So I don't know why we're going back on it. In my opinion, nothing's really changed. 
Um, you know, I've, I've seen people come in here and say, you know, the Constitution, the Founding Fathers. The Founding Fathers owned slaves and thought women were below them. So it doesn't mean that 300 years later we, we should be doing the same thing that the Founding Fathers said. This is not a free speech issue. They would not be for this, trust me. Um, you know, just so you can say some vulgar language. It does, just doesn't make sense to me. Um, we allow people to disagree with us. People disagree with us all. Most of the people that come in here disagree with us, right? Very rarely do we see people come in here and say, hey, you guys are doing a great job because those people stay home, you know? It's the people that disagree with us that come in here. And they have their, their three minutes in the beginning, their three minutes at the end to say whatever they want. I would say if this does go through and we end up changing this, that I would ask every president or chairman to actually read this because it says excessive repetition and irrelevant remarks are discouraged and the presiding officer has the authority to terminate the remarks of any speaker with such remarks do not adhere to this ordinance or other applicable law. So if people are repeating, let's stop them from speaking because that's what it says we can do, right? If they're talking about something that's not related to something on the agenda, which it happens all the time, let's have the chairman or the chairwoman throw them out. Right? I mean, I guess that's, we got to be tougher then, which is something I don't want to do. I want people to be able to speak. But for them to have to utter a couple of nasty, vulgar words, that's, that's what we're, we're dying on this hill to, to prevent? It's ridiculous. It's nonsense. You know, it's just another nonsense issue that we have to bring up in here. Um, you know, and, and to stop us from doing the job that we need to do, and that's to make this city better, continuously. I'm done. Alderman Clemens. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So I um, <clears throat> tend to agree with what the mayor uh, had to say, which, you know, I think striking the language crude and vulgar uh, and starting the sentence uh, to read uh, profanity and or obscene remarks are prohibited would be a good start. <clears throat> I agree with... Um, uh, I also agree with Alderman Lopez that, you know, it'd be nice to have the city attorneys come in and discuss this openly uh, so that we can get their understanding of why they feel that they can successfully um, sustain a, a, or, or, you know, uh, defend a, a lawsuit um, in particular with those two first words uh, stricken. When I, you know, presented this ordinance, obviously the, my objective was to make sure that profane and obscenity type language was um, not allowed. You know, the crude and vulgar portion of it, I guess, can be left up to interpretation. Um, but I think an obscenity is, is, an, is an obscenity, a profanity is profanity. And you know, that to me is very clear cut. Um, and <clears throat> that's what we're trying, in my opinion, that's what we're trying to prohibit because it's not about restricting people's free speech. You can come up here and you can call me an idiot and that's your opinion and you have the right to do it and you have the right to say it and there's nothing that I can do about it. And I support that 100%. We have had, and I have defended free speech, and I have defended the right of people to come up to that microphone on, throughout my career here on the Board of Aldermen. There have been times when there have been other aldermen in the past who have wanted to restrict at that microphone by residency. You had to be a resident of Nashua. There's people that, aldermen who have wanted to restrict the fact that you have to stay only germane to what is on the agenda. And every single time I have rejected and fought against that because it's not right. People should have the ability to come up and address us and say what they feel on any topic. Now granted there is a, a you know, public comment there's two public comment periods for that. Well, the first one is about stuff that's on the agenda. The second one can be about anything. And that's the right way to do it because you want to be able to hear from people. But there, there was a, a, 
And I'm gonna give this example. There was a resident who came up at the podium years ago and she would um, <clears throat> tell us that her skin was on fire and she would blame a city employee for that happening. But she never used obscenities and she never used profanity to say it. So you can come up and you can say and get across whatever it is, no matter where or, or what people think of it, you can say what you have to say without being profane and without being obscene. It does not restrict your freedom of speech. And if you think that it does, then you don't have a good grasp on the language or you want to create a spectacle. And either way, to me, that's just sad. So I think what we should do, in my opinion, is table this, have the legal department come in, give their opinion, and then we can go from there and decide what we want to do. Um, but to me, it would be removing those first two words modifying that second, those second two words and, and then going from there. That's, that's my opinion. But again, I would like to hear from the legal department how they would defend that. I'm going to weigh in here before uh, we get too far. So um, I agree with a lot of what has been said and I made it very clear when this first came up that I had my own reservations around the words that were being used. I'm, I'm, Communication is what I do for a living at the expense of setting like Alderman Jetty here. I think what, the things that we do in this chamber have unintended consequences. So if you think about the word vulgar and you put it in a different time period, women coming in and showing their ankles was vulgar, you know, a couple hundred years ago. So those types of things where there's an interpretation there, I get word nerdy about it, I know I do, but I think it's important because that context that we have right now may not be the same context that a board 30 years from now um, has. So I agree that having some support and recommendations from the legal department is important too. Because to the point of many of my colleagues, we're not trying to put any sort of um, restriction on your ability to come and tell us how you feel or what you want done in the city or how much I'm an idiot. All those things are fine. It's just about making sure that we can get through our business in the city and hear everybody um, in, a, in a peaceable, I believe is the word, an orderly manner. So though that's my thought as well. I support the idea of, of potentially tabling this, but I want everyone to have opportunity to speak. So I think I saw Alderman there, Gouveia. There, and there wouldn't be any problem in, in having the legal department come in. Yeah. I mean, I would have asked them tonight, but I didn't know what the committee's pleasure would be. So sure. I just thought I'd throw out an idea. What was that? Do you mind if I let Alderman Jetty speak? Or did you I was going to make a motion, so please let Alderman Jetty speak. Alderman Jetty, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I agree with Alderman Clemens. I hope that doesn't make him change his mind. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think that... Uh, you know, uh, you know, the people who, uh, uh, who, you know, who, who would like to see this changed, I, I, I think they're, you know, what, what they're concerned about is uh, their ability to come to the meeting and, and you know, and say what, what they think and criticize uh, the aldermen, the mayor, the government, uh, you know, put, put forth what they think are better ideas and, uh, and and you know and, and sometimes when they you know they get passionate about it and uh, and you know and they don't want this type of ordinance to be used as an excuse to shut them off and i you know i i don't think any of us really wants to do that but i think most of you agree with me that um, you know we ought to be able to conduct these meetings you know without resorting to language that that, you know that everyone would agree is 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 offensive. You know, I, I read somewhere that the Oxford English Dictionary has six hundred thousand words. So there's a 
is clearly a choice of a lot of words that can be used to express your opinion and, and express your negative opinion about government officials w without resorting to language that would be uh, considered you know, profane or, or obscene. And, um, you know, I, I, have, I have great amount of respect for, for uh, Attorney uh, Clementowicz. Is, is that the way it's pronounced? Uh, you know, he knows a lot more about, uh, about the First Amendment than I do. Uh, but, you know, I agree with the mayor's analysis of that Massachusetts case. The, the Massachusetts case, you know, the Massachusetts ordinance uh, you know, talked about all remarks and dialogue in public meetings must be respectful and courteous. And, and the court said, you know, that the, con the Massachusetts <coughs> Constitution, um, you know, said that, um, uh, you know, that, that citizens ought to be able to address, uh, you know, their legislators in a peaceable and orderly manner. And the court made the observation that peaceable and orderly is not the same as respectful and courteous. And, you know, the, the, um, the, the letter from Attorney Clementowitz says that, that the city could, you know, could, you know can, uh, you, know, could, you know, could restrict comments to, to being orderly and peaceable but it goes on to say that it cannot constitutionally prohibit speech that is crude, vulgar, uncivil, or profane. Well, I'm not sure, um, you know, I, I think that's Attorney Clement Howitz's opinion. That's not what the court in Massachusetts said. And, and, and there are many, you know, decisions, um, you, know, it, you, know, you know, by federal courts across Across the country, you know that that do say very specifically that um, you know ob obscene and profane language is not protected by the First Amendment. Um, you know your the First Amendment gives you the right to express your ideas. Um, it doesn't give you the right to use you know profane and obscene language. And there are cases that approve. Um, rules by city councils, you know, prohibiting uh, profane and obscene <coughs> language. So I think the mayor is on the right track, but I, I certainly agree we ought to take advantage of our legal department, have them come in. And I, I, if I could, uh, through you, ask the mayor, I, um, I think you said tonight, but I'm sure you said it the other night, that you were meeting with yeah. Attorney Clement Towitz. Yeah. Um, and did you suggest that compromise language, and what was his reaction to that? Well, maybe you want to ask him directly, but I, I mean, I, he didn't. Um, I don't think they agree that uh, necessarily that, as you said, it might be his opinion that even uh, limiting obscene and profane could be unconstitutional. But I think he would agree that the two words that. W are focused on are vulgar and crude are if are the mo more pro pro are the more problematic yes okay yeah he, he said uh, that it would be unconstitutional to prohibit speech that is crude vulgar uncivil or profane he doesn't say he doesn't use the word obscene in that no. in that group he does use profane but as you said, that's his opinion. That's no, he hasn't cited a case that says that. That's correct. Mm -hmm. What's that? Alderman Gavea? I think the word profanity could be better than the word profane. Because it's a little more this is why we need lawyers. explicit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, profane could maybe be a little broader, but. If, if I could just um, make an additional point. I, I, Alderman Jetty. The. Um, you know, there is a state statute, you know, we, you know, the, the Massachusetts case and, and the New Hampshire Constitution talks about, um, you know, peaceable and orderly. And, uh, you know, there is a statute, 
in the, in the criminal code, the New Hampshire criminal code, about disorderly conduct. So it's, 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 a, it's something that can be looked at as far as a definition of disorderly or something that is not orderly and, uh, and peaceable. And, uh, and, and that makes it a crime for someone to direct at another person in a public place obscene, derisive, or offensive words which are likely to provoke a violent reaction on the part of an ordinary person. And uh, so, so the, you know, the New Hampshire you know, statutes do have provision for prohibiting, you know, um, that type of language. So. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Gouveia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would say as somebody who helped write the legislation, I, th I would be open for conversation on an amendment that Alderman Clemens outlined. I think that could potentially be a good fix. I do want to hear what our legal department has to say, and I would also like to hear what the ACLU has to say. Obviously, they're a big organization. I don't think we bow down to anybody. But is this the fight we really want to dig our heels in when we've seen an organization like them go after much smaller things on larger scales? So I think there's a lot to weigh in here. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, move the table. The motion on the floor is to table. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion is tabled. <coughs> I will work with the mayor to uh, make sure legal is at our next meeting and if it is the pleasure of the committee, we can also request um, the ECLU come. And I will make sure legal comes at the next meeting, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, thank you very around. much. Be water <laughs> okay. All right, we are moving on to tabled in committee, which I believe is staying on the table. It is. Okay. And then we have public comments. Lori Ortolano, 41 Berkeley Street. When you bring legal in, would you please have them address the public comment uh, policy for the Board of Assessors? I know the ACLU didn't cover that in their letter, and they didn't have to, um, but that is just basic blanket language that says uncivil remarks will not be tolerated, and I think that should be struck. That is what Attorney Bolton told you to stri strike at the same time, and Attorney Leonard put it in over there. And your discussion about a compromise is encouraging. I want you to know, Alderman um, Tebow, when you said, I don't know anyone who's ever been interrupted or cut off, I have been. And it was at that finance meeting that the mayor, if you watch that tape, in 60 seconds, he shut me down. He was angry because I was upset about not being able to get records through economic development. And he started going right at me. And he took my three minutes right away. I lost the other two minutes and no one objected. When the mayor goes off track, nobody stands up and says, Mr. Mayor, give her the floor. She has her three minutes. And I told him to shut his pie hole several times. And his remark was, pie hole's a swear word. Well, it's in a Lizzie McGuire movie, and I don't think it's a swear word. Um, but it was an emotional thing. It was an emotional moment, and sometimes that happens. And no one stepped in. The same action happened to me in the public hearing in June with the mayor. He ran right over me, interrupted my comments, took the floor for over five minutes, and when I wanted to respond, Alderman Dowd said, time's up, and I had to sit down. This has happened to me repeatedly, which is why you have a federal suit by me on these constitutional issues. Not on swearing, just not allowing me to have my speech. So secondly, I want to address public information. I don't understand why the Board of Aldermen hasn't been a lot more active in enacting legislation to deal with open records issues. Why is it impossible in the city of Nashua, a city of this size, that a citizen has no place to go to say what records are available, where are they stored, and how can I get them? I can do that in virtually every other municipality I go to. We are supposed to, by charter and NRO, have a municipal records committee that addresses these issues. You have not had that committee formed in 20 years. Their job is to look at record availability, record retention, and record archival, and record disposal, as required by the state statute. 
why is it there's no place to go? 30 if seconds. You, if you go to an office and you say, are these records located here? The response is, under 91A, I don't have to answer you. You're being challenged in numerous lawsuits on this, that the right to know law doesn't allow you to say, I'm not gonna tell you where your records are. The town of Hudson, the Board of Selectmen, just wrote legislation for a right to know policy to deal with all of their issues because of the big construction project with Amazon putting in a facility which was withdrawn. Time. You should be doing the same. I don't see anyone else for public comment. General discussion. Alderman Tebow. Thank you. Um, I did attend that meeting on Zoom, so I did hear what was going on um, in that finance meeting. And the mayor is the chairman of that committee, so um, if he thought it was going off track, he was going off track. Um, but generally, that was a a painful meeting on both sides, I guess. Um, you know, and and you know, I you know, I didn't say it during because we ended up tabling it, but I I do agree with uh, Alderman Clemens' uh, change to go with profanity and or obscene remarks. Um, I think that's um, the better way to go. Whether legal cares or not, I think that's the better way to go. I mean, the legal approved what we had. I can't imagine they would go the other way, but I'm fine listening to them. Um, and I'm fine tabling it because this stays on. Um, and you know, to Alderman Lopez's points, you know, we literally got an email saying today that freedom of speech is again being violated, and that person is someone that hangs out at drag shows and protests the ability for them to have their free speech. So maybe we should have a drag show right here. That would be, I think, something worthy of this chamber. Um, but so I just, I, I. I struggle with using free speech as a tool to, to go after things that only they, certain people care about. People use it as their tool. And I think that's wrong. I think it's, it, it's wrong. It's a polit political stunts. Um, the ACLU didn't just find this somehow. Someone went to them. We could probably figure out who that is. Um, maybe we do a right to know of the ACLU. Um, you know, and you know, to Alderman Gavea's point, the ACLU, they would need someone to go and offer it, to put a case in. They're not they're just gonna sue us. So, you know, I don't care if they're coming for us or not. I mean, just add it to the suits, so. Alderman Clemens. Thank you. I, I just wanna say, I think what it tonight showed to me, at least for the group of aldermen who are here, is that we care about decency. We all do. Every single one of us in this room cares about decency and we wanna get it right. So I think we made the right decision tonight. And you know, when we talk about it next month, you know, hopefully we'll get some opinions. Obviously, you know, <clears throat> at the end of the day, I don't think that regardless of what way an alderman votes, at least I'm gonna say this, the aldermen that are in this room, how they vote is going to be about whether or not they're for or against decency. It's a matter of, to me, whether or not they are risk, and how risk adverse you are in wanting to challenge, how far do you wanna go? In other words, do you wanna fight the ACLU on this or do you wanna fight some other group on this or not? And to me, this, protecting our children and protecting um, the public from obscenities and from people coming up and basically using language that just does not belong in a public setting, I think is worth the fight in my opinion. But I think overall, we all, I think, agree with that. It's just a matter of, to me, how far do you want to go down that legal road? So I, I think, I, I am really happy with, with the alderman that I serve with. And uh, I, think, I think we're doing, uh, we're doing right by our citizens. Alderman Lopez. Um, so the terms uh, were used earlier, uh, idiot, moron, and imbecile. And 100 years ago, those would have been diagnostic terms. And because people use them as insults and misappropriated <clears throat> the intent and purpose of those, they became hate words and insults and all that kind of stuff. And there's, there's <coughs> worse ones. Like New Hampshire's uh, regulations prohibit, pe prohibit professionals from using similar language that starts with an R 
in any official capacity because of how stigmatizing and how damaging it can be. And I think there are plenty of terms out there that are even more insulting, provocative, or inflammatory to specific populations that we should be cautious of. When the mayor was saying, I don't think anybody's cheering for the profanity to come back, I was like, well, I mean, it would probably be nice because I, I have a, a pretty bad potty mouth at times in my personal life, and I put a lot of work into holding that back in the aldermanic meetings. So it might be nice to be able to just run amok every now and then and drop some F-bombs everywhere. Um, but I think ultimately that is disrespectful to the public. And I think that's where, unfortunately, the limitations of our power really may extend to. Because if someone's going to stand there and use the, their right to public speech and free speech and their platform, taxpayer funded in front of all of their community members to just blast people that they don't like, or to, to throw hate, we're not gonna be able to stay ahead of the curve when it comes to how they do that or what they do. Some of the people like involved in tonight's conversation have been very creative about how they, they hide you know, insults or um, trigger words or um, mm -hmm. insulting language in, in everyday things. I watched somebody walk up to a person who identifies as trans wearing an anti-trans shirt and on the surface have a completely you know, polite conversation. They walked away thinking that they had, they had been kind and whatever, and like, they also were wearing literally a, uh, a symbol that was super offensive to that person. It was the target of their hatred that showed the grace and the decorum, not whatever they told themselves. So I think it's, it's very subjective. I think it's important for us to have uh, legal representation to really refine this. And I think ideally, that's what the ACLU is really looking for is something that is respectful of at least the vast majority of people's willingness to participate and maybe aware of uh, certain population's rights not to be infringed upon by other people practicing their rights. There are limitations to free speech. You can't yell fire in a crowded room. You can't yell you know, threatening or, or, or terrifying um, comments you know, to tilt the children around. And I do think we need to have a certain level of decorum. And a lot of pressure is put on chairs and presidents, even tonight, where the public decides it's just gonna be unruly to prove a point. And that puts us all on edge, that, that breaks down the dialogue and it makes it us a little bit less functional as a community. Um, on another topic, because there are other topics, um, the legislation that uh, Director Bagley, I was definitely egging her towards, um, she brought it up last Friday that we were gonna have to have, probably have it come in under suspension in order to get it. Um, it's very, very necessary funding for some of the ongoing efforts uh, to tackle our, our homeless uh, problem and the uh, ancillary problems that contribute or exacerbate it. These are things I've talked about for years. Another term that was thrown in my direction by, I believe, Alderman Siegel in one, one meeting was I was accused of being a social justice warrior at the time, I wasn't exactly sure whether that was an insult or not. Um, I don't think it really turned out to be, because I think maybe social pragmat pragmatism, where you can see where a certain kind of situation is headed, whether or not people want to admit it or not, these homeless encampments and these unsheltered people and these homeless people have not suddenly appeared on our doorstep. They're a function of diminishing services and supports in our city and in our region. We've been taking a lot of very bold steps as aldermen now with regards to expanding housing stock and supporting our nonprofits and all that kind of stuff, but that, those resources are under fire constantly. There's always somebody looking at a development project who'd love to use that housing trust fund, which is no longer a affordable housing trust fund, uh, to kind of grease the wheels on X, Y, or Z, and maybe we'll use this definition of something versus that. So if we're gonna support what we did today by identifying and charging Director Bagley with being our public health officer, our chief public health officer, then we also have to be courageous and discerning ourselves when it comes time to making sure she has the tools that she needs. Great. All set? Mm -hmm. Can you already speak? It's general discussion, right? Okay. I'm gonna, I have something I actually want to oh, talk go about ahead. first. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I was just like, did you already speak? It's general discussion. <sighs> Um, so I actually wanted to address the um, discussion around reappointments. I think that there have been a couple of committee members who we, we've talked about this, you know, offhand in terms of when do people come in for reappointment? How often? 
and I think it would be interesting for this committee to think about that, um, whether it has to be a formal change. But I think to the point that was made this evening, sometimes people are reappointed, 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 and they haven't been in here in 10 years. And we don't know what's going on with that committee or we've never met that person. Um, so we don't necessarily have to have an answer right now, but I would love for the committee to just think about it um, in terms of how they feel about bringing reappointments in. Alderman Clemens? Yeah, so as a, as a former chair of, the, of, of this committee in the past and, um, you know, just being on the board, I, I think having a reappointment come in, having somebody who's being reappointed um, come in every now and then is a good thing. I don't think it should be um, an automatic, though, because I think we'd be extremely overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, imagine doing 15 interviews in one night, but I think like have. <laughs> for the, <clears throat> for maybe for some of the groups that, um, and this is just an idea, but some of the committees that, you know, we haven't touched upon with a new appointee in a while or somebody who's, you know, has a lot of experience who can bring a lot of, um, uh, discussion to us about that particular group or something I think would be would be great uh, every now and then but I wouldn't want to make it a standard practice just just my my own view. Alderman Gouveia did you want to respond to that? I would yeah I was gonna say the exact same thing I think it's good we check up with some of these committees do I think if we have a evening where there's three or four reappointments do we need to hear from all of them about the same committee probably not but Every now and again, yeah, absolutely. I think it's good to check in. Alderman Lopez, and then oh, no, no, no. everybody speaks twice. It's okay. So, <laughs> well, we're all talking about this, this is a different topic. topic. Now. <laughs> I'll let you talk. Um, so the um, so the the reason she came in was because I had heard things in the committee <coughs> or in the community that were concerning, but I was fairly confident she would be able to answer them um, about how arts money is used, about inclusion, about that kind of thing. Um, so it was a bit of a calculation on my part to say, okay, well, if people are going to say these things, then why don't we have somebody who's been doing the work and has the capability to answer those things and kind of clear the air? So I, I think, I think uh, Ms. Carlson did a great job of representing uh, what she's been doing and what she knows. And in that capacity, she did tell me that we don't ask the National Arts Commission what they do on a regular basis. They don't get an annual, like, here's what we're working on and... and uh, you know, audience with the uh, aldermen or anything like that. She was like absolutely willing to step forward and talk about the different things and confident that there were other committees as well. She pointed out the Cultural Connections Committee and I agree, the Cultural Connections Committee was working on a slideshow of all the different um, cultural representative groups in uh, Nashua and I, I never had anywhere to show it. Uh, so there are going to be opportunities to let committees that have something to say or want to hear from us to be able to do those and I think it makes sense to do it naturally through the appointments rather than coming up with like an arbitrary schedule um, and I think particularly if an alderman is hearing things in the community about a committee and wants to you know enable a member of that committee to show off all the work that they've been doing give them an opportunity yeah, and I think I would respond to that with, I think that makes a lot of sense and, you know, kind of dealing with it as things come makes a lot of sense. I also think I would say if there are committees that have presentations that they, you know, that we touch and we see and they want to come in and talk to us, I'd, I'd love to hear it absolutely uh, because we're putting people on these committees, but we don't always get to. We've got quite a bit on our own plates to not know what's going on with the National Arts Commission or the Cultural Connections Commission, so... Just, it, just putting it out there to anyone listening, but if your committee would like to uh, give us an update here at a committee level or at the Board of Aldermen, it's always nice to hear what's going on. Alderman Tebow. I'm gonna save most of my remarks for the remarks by all the aldermen, but I do wanna to respond to that. Um, so, yeah, to, to the last point that all the woman Kelly made, I think that um, having, coming to the Board of Aldermen, why just us, why just this committee? Right, if someone wants to present something that their committee, like when we had the Carolyn Whaley come down for the Great American Downtown so they could explain what they do because there was confusion over some of the different committees. And so I would love to have a presentation. Now, sometimes in Board of Aldermen, we don't always have a ton. So that would be a perfect time to bring somebody in to do one of those. And I, like, 
I don't think it should necessarily be here. I think it should be with all. I think everyone should see it, you know, but that's my two cents. Everyone all set with general discussion? We had a lot tonight. Okay, remarks by Alderman. <laughs> anyone have any remarks? I think uh, I don't see anybody. Okay. Oh, Alderman Diva. Thank you, um, uh, Madam uh, Chairwoman. Um, so, two things. One's going to be small, but th this first one, so this is probably small too. Um, you know, Alderman Lopez made a point, and I think, you know, when we talk about certain language, it's, there's also one we didn't really touch upon um, directly, indirectly by Alderman Lopez, is, you know, there's also racist words, there's homophobic words, and, you know, I guess I am naive that I think that all people, or most people, right, in, in society, don't want to use the type of words that would hurt somebody else's feelings. And I guess I'm just a naive person that, I mean, I grew up with a Vietnam vet. I've heard every word possible to man that um, anybody can say that's negative um, or profane. Um, and so it doesn't offend me, but I don't want to use the type of language in certain circumstances that would offend somebody else or offend a segment of the population. So it's, it's hard for me when I see people wanting to fight this and, um, I do understand the um, generalness of the crude and vulgar part of it, so I get that. But I just think, <coughs> I, I don't know. Again, na naivety, right? I just think that, that, that people should be better people, and I guess I can't depend on that. But um, the second thing, I just want to congratulate Fairgrounds. Uh, middle school, they, they got to the semifinals in, in baseball, but lost today in those semifinals to Hollis Brookline. They were the last middle school in Nashua standing, or public one anyway. Um, they had a great season and, and uh, unfortunately got beat pretty good today. But I just want to congratulate those kids. A lot of them, most of them are actually eighth graders and are moving on to high school next year, including my son. So congratulations to the fairgrounds. Are there any other remarks? Do you have a motion? Alderman Clements. Motion to adjourn. The motion is to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. And we are adjourned at 9.06. Thank you, everyone.